Welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. I'm Tina Spring, and I'm here with my co-host, Julie Fudge, the awesome Smith. Um, <laughs> and we want to welcome you back to Your Family Dog, and I'm already making her laugh, so it's a good day. Um and so we, what we wanted to talk about today was um, a podcast you may or may not have heard yet with uh, Dr. Catherine Fowler. You know, podcast hosts are social. Like, so after we were done recording, we three ladies were having a, a fun conversation, kind of off air, if you will. And we were discussing um, how... Being in a family and raising dogs can be a little bit frustrating, right? That that typically there's yes. one member of the family who kind of takes charge of, you know, training or raising the dog. And that um, oftentimes there is someone, Christopher fully admits it in our house, um, in, our, in our family, there is someone who is the untrainer. <laughs> right, so, right. And how frustrating, like, that can be and how... I hear about it from dog training clients. Julie hears about it. And even Dr. Fowler hears about it. And she was using the example of like dogs getting table scraps that maybe they ought not have or pets, right. or pets right. getting away with behavior that that is less than ideal from a health standpoint. So that led into this whole wackadoo conversation where I talked about something that I had learned from Kay Lawrence at learning about dogs in England um, called sequencing. And I don't know if that's Kay's intellectual property or not. If it is, she's brilliant. Whoever came up with it was brilliant. Um, but it led into this whole conversation about how to use environmental cues to cue the dog so that perhaps we don't have to change what all of the humans are doing like we don't have to get buy-in from every single member of the family including the toddler in order to get a, a dog to maintain a behavior um and so that's called sequencing it's called it's called sequencing and it's building in environmental cues it's something your dog does naturally right so right right absolutely i mean when my alarm goes off in the morning that's zuzu's cue to start nuzzling me mom 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 and then, you know, we get up and I take my thyroid pill and we go downstairs and she goes out and then we come in and I go in the buzzler's pantry and she sits and we have breakfast. And so, yeah, that the it's a whole series of cues because there's a routine that we generally follow in the morning. You know, when I go into the restroom, right, to uh, brush my teeth, with, she has to sit right next to me and get petted. Because we do that right there, you know. So that's where we do this. All these little, this is where we do this. So therefore, you must pet me right now. Because one time when I reached down and I, I was petting her, and she leaned up against me, and so now that's what we do. So all these little things that happen between the time my alarm goes off and she actually gets served breakfast are now a whole sequence of little environmental cues that trigger her to do specific behaviors. Right. And one of the amazing things about sequencing is dogs are building them anyway. It's one of what I love, part of what I loved about um, learning about sequencing from Kay was that our dogs are attaching meaning to things that happen in the environment all the time. I mean, I don't know about you. I've never had to teach a dog that a doorbell, doorbell means lose your mind. Right. I've never had to teach them <laughs> what their bowl means. Like and I've worked with some dumb dogs. I'm kidding there. I've only ever worked with one dog that I actually would have said was dumb. And that dog actually had like when we did radiographs, there wasn't anything in there. He pretty much just had wow. a brainstem. So so that dog struggled to learn what a dog food bowl and his name meant, unsurprisingly. Um, but. Generally speaking, our dogs are learning sequences all the time. And one of the things that happens is they learn unwanted sequences. So they, they're very good, kind of like kids picking up cursing. They're really good. Or you talking about your mother-in-law. They remember that, right? <laughs> they share it that beautifully, right? So, so our dogs, too, pick up sequences that sometimes – we would, our preference would be that they didn't have it. So they learn. Like for example, go ahead. 
you pick up your car keys and the dog rushes to the door. Right. And and then will not move away from the door because I know that if you picked up your car keys, you're going to go through this door and I'll be darned if I'm going to be left behind. Right. So, you know, car keys oftentimes are a signal to a dog that they, they may get very excited or even anxious. It's like somebody's leaving and I'm going to go with them. So you can't make me get away from the door. So that can be that that's a, a, a very simple one, but it's a pretty common one. I well, think. I mean, even picking up the leash or the collar or the harness or right. the gentle leader or whatever tools you use. Right. The, the or the or picking up the cookie bin or, you know, there's like a bajillion that dogs attach. And so right. one of the things I find really freeing for families is is that one member of the family really can truly just build a sequence and then mm-hmm. they can reinforce that sequence when other family members are doing it too and have a much better chance that the sequence will hold even when they're not there. So off air before right. before we started recording this, Julie was explaining about her sequence um, with with her dog with the pantry, and I said, well, if your husband went in the pantry, would she do the same thing? And there was a little bit of a hesitation because it may be as simple as your husband never feeds her, right? Um, or you haven't practiced it with your husband doing the chore. Right. So that maybe is so, a little and, bit of cumbersome piece is reinforcing it for the dog when there's a different handler. I know when I do board and train, that's that's part of the difficulty. Transferring the skill right. from you do it for me, can you do it for your mom too? <laughs> right. Well, for example, I think a good example of something like that is if you don't want your dog in the dishwasher, Right. It, maybe you don't care if he licks the plates, but maybe your husband does. Or like we were living in Princeton and Zuzu kept wanting to crawl into the dishwasher. So one of the things you can do is you can teach the dog that when the dishwasher opens, that's your cue to go to bed. Right. Get out or of the kitchen. To, you know, get out of the kitchen. Right. And so you practice that with the dog so that the next time the next person opens the dishwasher, hopefully – the cue is going to be for the dog to go in the other room. But one of the things that is really helpful is that you reinforce that by you have a series of people opening the dishwasher. Right. So that that becomes the regular. I think my husband would really like it if I did that one. So, so, so honestly, like I actually really like being able to say to a family, once I'm explaining what this crazy sequencing thing is, but saying to a family, what are some sequences your dog already knows? Do you enjoy those sequences or do you wish they were different? And then just how to build it differently, right? So, um, I mean, we're building sequences all the time. We just aren't thoughtfully doing that most of the time, right? So you're doing it anyway. So it's just, can we make it more intentional? So really common examples for the average family is what is the dog supposed to do when somebody opens a door, right? For mo- for many dogs right. that we get calls from those families, it is race out the door and get horribly maimed in a car accident, right? And that's not like, that's not what we want. So we can totally teach a dog, not only don't go through the door, but even give ourselves some behavioral safety distance by saying, instead of don't, don't do something because that's not really a behavior. I mean, it is, but it's not, it's an inhibition. Um, What do I want you to do instead? So if I teach a dog and it really doesn't take very long that when I, when I handle the doorknob, that means hot dog happens on the dog bed on the far end of the room, a dog will pretty quickly arrive at selling their soul for chicken hot dog like that they're willing to do that that is a trade they are typically willing to make sometimes you have to break out salmon so um and and can we add a modicum of safety in addition can we you know maybe take a leash tie it to a heavy piece of furniture put the dog bed next to that put the dog on the leash so that we have an extra layer of safety for the ninja like dog terrier (laughs) Who may sit across the street when the doors open a half an inch? Sure. So that we have, again, some behavioral safety, behavioral safety built in. Um, It's not going to be 
my only method, but it's going to be one of them. Right. And I, I do like tethering. Um, so that the, the, the tether's not real tight. The tether is loose so the dog can move a little bit, but you want the dog to have that extra modicum of safety while you're training it. And then you can start working towards, um, or another thing I've, I've done is I've actually put a gate over the doorway. I had a family so, who um, had a great idea. They had a Yorkie. They used this crazy high tension, like basically saran wrap. They like shrink wrapped the front door, like, the bottom three feet. So there was basically an invisible barrier. So, so it was like, it was hysterical, but it worked. Like the Yorkie bounced off of it once and went, well, that's weird. I can't go out the door. Now that, wow, I like that. that one they did for a door. The dog is never allowed to go out. And that's another piece that I think, um, I think sometimes we miss is, how is the dog supposed to know the difference between when they're supposed to go out the door when you're in a hurry and you're not using good skills and management and when your children are dashing out the door? Like for dogs, I think sometimes that's muddy water. So um, having, in my opinion, having some clear signals to the dog, like I try to limit which door we go in and out of with the dog so that I don't have to train nine different locations. Like we can go, okay, these doors are impenetrable. You're not allowed to go through them. This is the one that the dog might go through so that it cleans it up a little bit for the dog. Um, I think that's a very good idea. I think it's a very good idea. Do I mean, most households, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm lunatic, but like we don't go out our front door very often. We go out the door that's closest to where the car is. So, well, we have two doors, our back door and our front door, and I use them both a so, lot. So, so that's not necessarily going to work for every household, right? Right, right. Well, that's why you can also train a cue where if, if for example, whenever the hand, a hand is on the door knob, right. that the dog learns a, a sit and that I don't move from my sit until I get the release cue, which is tough because, um, you know, a if, if there's a squirrel on your porch, right there, that's, that's going to be the release. Cue. I mean, this morning so. I, so I have a little five month old Yorkie here who is the rootinest, tootinest little five pound puppy you've ever met in your life. Uh, <laughs> he's hysterical. It's, <laughs> he's like five pounds of you're doing it wrong. Um, and so we're working on door dashing, <laughs> right? Cause he gets under your feet and like, you're going to, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to like, I don't know, break my, hip because this goofy puppy is like I will just launch out the front door and this morning while we were working on it a deer walked across like I don't know eight feet from the front door like you can't plan that I have the world's dumbest deer in my yard so fortunately (laughs) his brain turned to goo and he was unable to ambulate um but that like that would have been a 911 and what I would say is like for me I want more behavioral distance than a sit right at the door. I just don't want, I, right. it's like they're in the starting blocks for the average dog. <laughs> like, right. Well, you can also train the sit to be, yeah. Oh, you know, like for example, where my front door is, I have a foyer. I could train the sit the in the living room. Right. Yes. Right. Beautiful. Outside the foyer. Right. You know, so you sit here and then you're less likely to see what's right outside the Absolutely. door. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so if you're you're here and then I can release you say, okay, let's go. Right. So Or so the, whatever the release word so is. There are some basic ones I really like to teach. I like to teach get out of the kitchen, which is loosely when a human crosses the plane into the kitchen, the dog is going to be reinforced somewhere else. Right. So whether that's on a settle mat where they can watch you or a crate or behind a gate or whatever, just in the next room. Right. Um, because I don't want to dump spaghetti water on me or a dog, right? I don't, I don't want to drop a lasagna because I tripped over a dachshund. These are all things that have happened in my life. Um, I, I was thinking these are very specific examples. Yeah. These are very specific <laughs> examples. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Lots of- well, you know, things can happen even when dogs aren't in the kitchen. Like we had a, a party last week for um, our Venezuelan who was getting married and my daughter took some beautiful scones out of the oven. And I said, well, why don't you, and she went to put them on the table. I said, no, why don't you 
why don't you put them here on the cooling rack? And she turned and promptly dropped them all on the floor and created a, so we scooped it up, put it in a pan and created lemon ginger goo. Um, so things like that. And But at that point, Zuzu was outside begging for baked brie. So, um, which... <laughs> My dogs don't even which, know baked brie exists. Well, hopefully she dog. doesn't. I Well, she didn't get any, I don't think. <laughs> um, she's not telling anyway. Um, so otherwise, there would have been hot, gooey scones right. all over her. Right. And the average dog so, is not going to go, you know what? I bet I'm going to burn my mouth on that. Right. And like, hell, I'm kind of smart. I burn my mouth on coffee almost every morning. Right. And I know, like, don't like sip off the top. Right. It's <laughs> right. So, well, the only thing I would say is that the pan clattering to the floor probably my, would have scared the bejeebers. Right. Out of right. So the advantage of like, slightly going... fearful dogs. So, so <laughs> I think right. often if we can think in terms of and help families think in terms of kind of the stuff that infuriates them, like the stuff where the dog is underfoot a lot, or the stuff that annoys them, because we all have a different annoyance scale, um, and solving those issues first, right? And and thinking in terms broadly of like what what annoys our partners, what annoys other members of the household, and try to come up with teaching like that beautiful answer of teach an alternative behavior that doesn't fit. Right. Um, I will say a lot of families I work with who grab a hold of that idea are trying to do it like at the razor's edge and distance is your friend. Like if your dog's nose is pointed at the crack where the door opens and they're breathing in the outside air with the deer on the other side, you're too close. Like move them off. You can always practice that skill close to the door when the dog's more mature and the behavior. Right. And, and I feel like I say that almost Every day to every client, distance is your friend. It's, it's just, it's about everything. Distance is your friend. I was working with a little dog. Oh, sweet, sweet, sweet. I don't know what it was. Pity lab golden noodle mix <laughs> thing. And it was just adorable. And we get very excited when we see other dogs on Lee. And I'm like, Okay, well, one of the things is, is let's figure out what your threshold distance is. At what point is he noticing other dogs, but he's not losing his brain? Because that's the distance we need to be working in back of. Right. So if, if he's losing his brain at 25 feet, we're working at 35 to 40 feet to begin right. with. Right. You know, so when you first notice the dog, go, oh, look, mom, it's a dog. That's where we're working. And we're going to. And so we talked about one of the things I talked about with um um, my owner yesterday is the idea of escape routes so that if you are surprised when you're out walking, you turn a corner and there's a dog, you need to be thinking in terms of both physical and mental distance for your dog. And I think the same kind of thing has to do with those cues that we want them to do inside. You need to think in terms of both physical and mental distance for your yeah. dog the physical distance may be okay but the mental distance isn't if i can smell the deer through the door right so i can see yeah, the so, squirrel <laughs> squirrel squirrel right it's squirrel. why there are donuts in so, this house because if i could see them oh my no, well if there were donuts in the house there wouldn't be donuts in the house if you know what well, i mean there would be but they'd be inside <laughs> me that's right right so um yeah much in the um, same way so my I thyroid need... tablet is in the house, in me. Yes. Interesting. So, so, so ones I really like have to do with kind of those everyday things. Um, right. And I actually use this a ton with families with, that are expecting or even families mm -hmm. with special needs. I have a sweet family I'm working with um, in another state that one of the children – has a tendency to have their emotions get the best of them. Um, and so there is a certain amount of shrieking <laughs> that's happening. And so one, this is a little 50 shades of gray dog edition, but we have actually conditioned the dog that shrieking 
doesn't mean we're all going to die because we have kind of a, a soft, fearful dog. So we've actually classically conditioned that shrieking makes chicken happen. Um, and we are now working on shrieking means chicken happens in mom's bedroom. So that we're giving right. one, we're not having the dog in conflict with the child that the dog is running to mom at the same time the child needs the mom. Um, Mom's not getting burned out having more than one needy individual in the family to wrangle at a time. Um, And one of the other children knows that when shrieks happen, that means go get a Kong for the dog and deliver it to mom's bedroom. So we have like a system so that right. everyone's needs are being taken care of. No one is being, you know, well, maybe not moms. We we might need to, I don't know, have a <laughs> glass of wine, hit the counter. But that's the story for a different podcast. Um, but there, but there's like this, there's this behavioral cascade that happens. Right. Now, in a perfect world, we would not be doing it over the shriek. We would be doing it over an ante, uh, antecedent. So it would be, right. so if the example was I had a child who would beautifully follow a lovely behavior chain and stomp their foot and then shriek, we would do it over maybe the foot stomp or take the deep breath or whatever it's going to be. Because I want to, again, give the dog some safe behavioral distance. Not that this family would right. endanger the dog, um, but for a sensitive dog, just, you know, the blood pressure increase of a temper tantrum might be a bit much. So I, I've done this with families where we might have a family member who has any variety of special needs. Um, teaching a dog that right. someone with a walker or someone with a cane means move out of the walkway, right? So that so there's all these really beautiful, easy peasy ways we can do this. Absolutely. And one of the things that I did want to bring out that I was really glad you said is the first thing you did was you count, you classically conditioned the shriek to be to mean chicken. So you took care of first the dog's emotional needs. And if you hadn't taken care of the emotional needs by changing his response from one of fear to one of, oh, this means chicken, you wouldn't have been able to then add in the behavioral response of moving to another room. I think one of the things that people forget is that dogs have emotions too. And sometimes we need to take care, we need to change their underlying emotional state from one of fear, apprehension to one of anticipation, acceptance, whatever, because that needs to come first. And once we have sort of emotional, a bit more emotional stability and the dog is taking treats, then I can, I can then uh, start to train an alternative behavior of moving out of the way. Right. So I think sometimes when we're talking about environmental cues, there may not be an emotion involved here. It may just be a matter of simple propriety or functionality of the family that this would function much better for me if you weren't underfoot why I'm baking scones. Right. It's like the elegant. On the, right. Can can right. we get things more elegant for the family, more seamless? And by the way, with less angst at the dog, less angst at your spouse. Right. If if, for example, your spouse allows the dog to lick the dishes in the dishwasher and that makes you a crazy person. Well, if we've actually preempted and taught the dog that someone walking into the kitchen means go to your crate, a bully stick happens there, well, that is a trade that the average quadruped is willing to make. And now you're not fussing at your husband or your wife, right? Like you're not- Or the dog. Or or the dog or your child, right? Um, Right. So it, 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 it helps to promote- harmony within the family yes, and it's portable. but so so simple yeah so simple things can can add some elegance and harmony and peacefulness to a, a family that just needs some tweaking right but there's also the case in which the sequencing helps to provide just basic security and um um sort of temperamentally <laughs> um sound environment for a family. So you have somebody with a special needs, 
and you have a dog with a special needs, then you need to be looking at sequency as a way to provide emotional support as well as spatial support for this family. And I think it's kind of important to understand that sometimes it's a little bit more complex than just, I don't want you in the dishwasher. Oh, absolutely. Right. Like, um, I have a, I actually have an apprentice right now who's lovely. She's smart and pretty. And her dog has decided that any UPS truck is a problem. And it is a problem that she is just the dog to take care of. So we have been classically conditioning, but the issue we were facing was, okay, well, what do you do in the car? And so actually, I'm going to go back to Kay Lawrence again. I got to see her 150 years ago in Atlanta, and she talked about um, the where's the bunny exercise, which is like you're driving in the car randomly, not associated with any stimuli, say where's the bunny and throw a handful of kibble over your shoulder. It'll all knock around in the car, drive down, and it it you know, it will naturally gravity go to the bottom of the car. And now you're able to float your dog over a stimuli as that becomes, you know, stronger. Right. So in the beginning you preempt and then eventually you have a dog who, when they see the UPS truck, like we're talking a little bit of work, but eventually you get a dog that when they see the jogger, when they see the UPS truck, when they see the other dog, you, they are like wag, 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 Surely kibble's going to end up in the floorboard of the car. Um, messy, yes, but a really effective way to keep you from Absolutely. getting in a car accident. Um, I think a lot of times the families I talk to are just doing the best they can to survive their day. And any time mm-hmm. that we can, like, that I can mama to mama or grandma to grandma or, you know, to dad or whatever – Say, okay, let's take a step back and see what we can, like, lots of times they're saying, like, well, I don't have, I don't have time to train the dog. Like, I love you. You're training the dog anyway. You're just training all the things you don't (laughs) want, right? So let's, what would give you some bandwidth? Well, if you weren't chasing the dog for 45 minutes after the school bus comes, well, heck, that's 45 minutes we could allocate to other things that are spectacularly more fun. So how about if we just take time? to practice it. And, and I do sometimes ask kids to help. Like I will totally put a post-it note on a door that says, where's the dog right before you open this door, where is the dog? Is the dog safe? Right. We can do all sorts of things to help cue family members in a polite, loving, kind way to help us reinforce the really important skills that we need for our dogs so that we're not all fussing at each other or God forbid right. having expensive vet bills trying to patch dog up. So um, when I had well-trained dogs many moons ago, if you open. Yeah, I used to have those too. Yeah, yeah. I had a, Once upon a time, I had a well-trained dog. Yeah, but, so you, know, you could, somebody. I gave it up for Lent one year. And <laughs> never, never took it back. <laughs> right, yeah, that's this right. is a sin we shall not have again. So you could open all of my crate doors and the dogs wouldn't come out. So if I had a pet wow. sitter who, you know, somehow got, you know, had their dog out and my dog didn't like their dog, we'll make something up. Um, they had that extra layer of safety. So I teach dogs often, like the doorbell and knocking means go to your crate. Um, I like the crate because I can secure you there. I often teach dogs that babies crying means go to your mat, right? So you're not underfoot with mom. Um, And we typically are delivering a Kong because babies tend to cry for a little while. Um, Getting that dog to wag their tail at mom when moms kind of, especially first time mamas who are feeling a little bit over or dads getting overwhelmed with that crying, um, having the dog wag their tail at them does help. Like you could have a really nice conversation with the dog about like, yes, this is very loud. Um, But like just building in some of that, the beauty and the ease of having the 12 year old dog only we're getting it right. only we're getting it in the year old puppy because we were intentional with what we were teaching. Um, I think most dog trainers, if you talk to them while we love the young whippersnappers, our hearts just melt over that 10, 11, oh, yeah. 14 year old dog because they're like a pair of jeans that fit you. Perfect. And so I really want families to have that 
sooner rather than later. Right. Well, I think one of the things, and I, and those are all, that's beautifully said, beautifully said, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things that came to my mind when you were talking was sometimes this is easier than you think, because sometimes what you can do is you can just add a cue, and you probably do this unintentionally. I know, I can just say to my dogs, bedtime, and we all know that it's time to go into the bedroom and you know, get on our bed or go in our crate or one of the dogs sleeps on the bed, right? I get up on the bed. So I didn't sort of in some ways intentionally teach that. Right. But I would say bedtime and we'd move. So I think that you can add cues to behaviors you're already doing, which will then instill that behavior in the dog. I remember with um, with my, my last flat coat, um, he slept on the bed and um, he would come up and snuggle <gasps> with me and I'd say, he slept on the bed. He did. And then oh I would tell goodness. him oh, time to go sleepies. And that was his cue to go down to the end of the bed and curl up in a little ball, go sleepies now. And he go sleepies. And it was only because I kept saying every time he'd go down to the end of the bed, I said, oh, go sleepies. That he learned. That means I go to the end of the bed and curl up in a ball for the rest of the next night. time. I'm introducing you as, Something like Julie Peanut Butter Fudge Smith. There's a little bit of nut job in there. I'm teasing. So, so but but I what, I, what I'm saying no, but I is love that it, it yeah. was a se- it's a it's a sequence that happened, and I didn't even realize I was teaching right. it because I just used the same cue every night when he would do that particular behavior. Right, so- and so I think that sometimes it doesn't have to feel as overwhelming as what we may make it out to be. It can be very simple. Right. So, at times. so the real beauty of sequencing is not having to tell the dog, right? The reach for the doorknob implies what it is I want you to do. The opening of the dishwasher means do this. The doorbell means right. do this. The baby crying means do this. The picking up my car keys means do this. My experience is that most dogs are really joyful about knowing what to do. They're anticipatory right. learners. Even the dog, so dogs with separation anxiety, right, who maybe have not been taught how to be comfortable alone, surely know what your what your car keys mean, right? It means the cascade right. of error and destroying themselves and everything around them. So we can, I just, I like being able to say to families, when your child, you can teach your dog that when your child picks up their backpack, that means go to mom, or that means go to your crate, or that means go lay on your settle mat, or that's when the Kong is going to happen in the kitchen or whatever, right? Like we can just build in, this is what happens that, that just makes it easier for everyone. And then if, if my mom gets sick and I have to go stay with her at the hospital and Christopher is getting the kids off to school, when the child puts on the, the backpack, the dog is going to go to the kitchen looking for the Kong. The Kong might not happen because Chris might not know the rules necessarily. House is a little bit stressful at the moment, but the dog didn't run out the front door. Right, right. I have right. one family that they're the kids. They have three dogs. They have three kids. Each child, when they go to pick up their backpack, goes and gets a Kong for their dog. They're each assigned a dog. They go and get the Kong off the counter and they put the dog in the crate and then they go to the bus stop. Like we can build this for our kids. Right. And here's the thing. We're teaching them executive skills that help. Like they say goodbye to their dogs. Like they're learning how to interact with this other or interrelate with this other species that honestly is even going to help them parent when they're adults, right? That they're going to have magical relationships with the dog instead of some horror story of when I was eight years old, I was leaving to go for the school bus and some terrible thing happened and I'll never forget it. And so I'm a bad person and I'll never have a dog, right? Like, I I don't know about you. I hear that 
those sad stories a lot. I don't, I don't, I'm tired of sad stories. I'd like to hear right. it's awesome stories. So, so I think, you know, we've lost, I think by being busy just as a culture, um, the elegance of having these really beautiful routines. And I think they serve parents, right? They, they serve husbands and wives, they serve the dog, they serve the kids, they serve all of our partners, they serve, you know, grandma when she comes to live with us. Um, right. Well, you, one of the things that I have found is, is and we've talked a little bit about this before, is that um, I do have a hierarchy of being and people always outrank dogs. And what I have found is that if I take care of the family, I'm taking care of the dog. So if we're putting in place routines that help the family manage their day and their dog better, right, I'm also helping that dog. Absolutely. That dog is now being provided with an environment that is predictable and non a lot less emotional or angst-driven. And so taking care of families and helping them to find a way in which their lives run a little bit more smoothly is going to take care of their dogs as well. So sequencing is something that you can really do that use the environmental cues that happen as a, as a matter of fact in your life to teach your dog the desirable behaviors you want him to have and to reduce the undesirable behaviors. Because what you're going to find is we don't have to punish. Right. We don't have to punish the dog for undesirable behaviors because we are redirecting to a desirable behavior. Or, or grouse at our partners or grouse at the kids right. or grouse at our mother-in-law or whoever. Right. Like not, I don't know about you. Like it, most of who, usually whoever the dog trainer is in the house is kind of primary on the caretaker list in general, right? That person my experience is they're typically kind of worn out and they just want things to be easier. So that's where I think this comes in. I think, um, I think one of the ways that I can bless the world is to try to help whoever that person is organizing breakfast and getting kids out the door in the morning and making sure everybody has coffee and the dog gets fed and all that stuff, making all of that easier and more seamless starts their day off better. It does. Absolutely. Which, you know, Absolutely. maybe stops road rage or makes us less cross with our kids or whatever. That's right. It's, it's an act of kindness to the world. It's an act of kindness to your family. It's an act of kindness to, to yourself. You. And it's yeah. an act of kindness to the world. So use those environmental cues as a way to teach your dog that um, good things happen when we behave in a certain way that makes everybody's life easier. So, so can I think we, it's been a great ask discussion. Our audience to like give us issues where like where they struggle and that we'll help them build some cues. Would that be fun? I think that's it. That would be fun. So if you would like to participate in our I need help because my dog is doing something wild and I don't know what to do quiz, you can go to our website yourfamilydogpodcast.com and send us an email via feedback at yourfamilydogpodcast.com well, you and we will address too, right? those. Like we can do it on Facebook. Yes, we do have a new Facebook Woo-hoo! page. Thanks to Tina who has driven me to do a Facebook page. So you can also connect with us on Facebook at Your Family Dog. So one of two ways, you can give us a message and we will try to get back to you in as timely a fashion as possible with some answers to these questions that you may have. The other thing we would also love to hear from you is um, what is it that you want us to talk about? Are there other issues that are coming up that you would like to address? We would be happy to hear what you would like us to talk about. And if you do like us, we would ask that you give us a review, a five-star review on Stitcher or Google Pod or Google Pod, how about Google Play or Apple Podcasts? Because that or, or the even higher Facebook, rankings we like get. share us, share us with, share us. share us with, you know, that mom, that grandma, the dad, the uncle, the aunt, the, the school teacher, the preschool teacher, right? Feel free to share us. Right. Like we want to help the world. That's right. And the more we get ratings on some of these things, the more people will be able to find us because we'll come up higher in a search. So. Thank you very much. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll see you all next time on Your Family Dog. 
Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.